Welcome to a new episode at Access to Perspectives Conversations. I'm very glad to be able to welcome today Eleonora Colangelo, who works in like one of my most favorite cities on this planet, Firenze, also known as Florence in Italy, uh, in English, um, in it in Italy, and um, and Eleonora, you're an editorial outreach specialist working for Frontiers. Um, yeah. yeah, the publisher, and um, and we will talk about multilingualism. Um, for both of us, being being both multi multilingual, <laughs> and, um, and applying also language in our um professional lives. Um, so maybe to get us started, would you like by introducing yourself? Where yeah, what what your background is, what you your studies were about, your research, and now. Um, how did you decide to join Frontiers and to yeah. switch, the, <laughs> switch the position from contributing to research um, scholarly writing now, um, yeah, helping to publish um, research for others? Yeah, uh, so thanks for asking, Joe, and thanks also for inviting me to talk about a topic which unites us in a certain way. So I have a nice and funny transition story about that because I am Italian, as you said, and I work in the scholarly publishing sector uh, since two years. Uh, as you recall, I'm currently serving as an editor outreach specialist at Frontiers, which is a leading open science company dedicated to accelerating scientific discovery for healthy lives on a healthy planet, just to mention Frontiers tagline. Um, the workspace I am integrating to is very eclectic in terms of cultures and languages, so I am aware of what working in a multilinguistic milieu might mean. But, you know, I could say that my relationship with languages is very complicated because before that I studied ancient languages, in particular <laughs> ancient Greek and Latin. Uh, Wait, so I'm just my academic... into Greece. Sorry, I just needed to throw this in here. <laughs> And it's like not Greece per se, or just if you want to say Athens, Athena, but yeah. it's like, it's not my first time, but it was the first time after 17 years, and it's again, it's still such a beautiful city as well, yeah. like we postulated for Florence. <laughs> so <laughs> why did you decide, so I had to study Latin at school, and you wonder, so why, why studying a language that's not spoken anymore? What when what, what uh, yeah, I think that it's a cultural it's a it's a cultural phenomenon here in Italy because we are very much sensitized by ancient cultures. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we breathe uh, ancient cultures around us. So I think it's very natural for us to develop a certain passion for Latin and ancient Greek. Then there is a personal issues behind personal story beyond that, because my father um, is a uh, veteran passionate about uh, about ancient cultures, in particular ancient Greeks. So it has been very natural for me to, you know, to to embrace this kind of 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 passion. Uh, and uh, it it has been, I think, the the most wonderful journey uh, on my life. My mm -hmm. academic background focused primarily on ancient history and classics, um, and that is a field of study where the predominant languages nowadays are, by order of impact, German, English, and French. So even Italian can be considered, you know, as a minority language in that field of study. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but just to come back to our topic, uh, I have to say that my experience as a nomad early career researcher has made me even more passionate about multilingualism in scholarly publishing, because at a certain point, I embraced the anthropology, mm. which allowed me to study ancient languages and ancient cultures from the anthropological point of view. So there's been a, an important switch, uh, scientific switch in my life, I think. Um, plus, as a part of my PhD studies, I held visiting fellowships uh, 
in Athens, Oxford, Geneva. So I gained a sort of extensive knowledge from several institutions across Europe. I faced myself with other colleagues who came from different cultural, linguistic, religious contexts, but we were all united by the same mission that was to understand, uh, communicate and convey ancient knowledge from the point of view of ancient speakers. So mm. just to sum up, uh, I worked in a field characterized by intersectionality in terms of languages because I studied ancient or so-called dead languages mm. and I collaborate in the meantime with people coming from uh, from all over the world and many of them spoke rarely English in their research and teaching activities. So this is uh, let's say the big framework of my story, but should I single out two key moments that sensitize myself about multilingualism in general, I will speak of two episodes. Uh, the first episode was in 2016 during a workshop in Krakow, which was mostly in Polish. And at that moment, I really noticed how it is to be on the other side, you know, because there was hardly anyone to talk to. But I realized also that they were doing something special and wonderful uh, in, their, in their field. And this was important to connect with these people to advance research. Uh, and that's when I first started thinking about the importance of translation in my field. Uh, and I found out what, at what extent the dominance of French and English language publications in the academic world for my specific research area was limiting the range of perspectives and voices represented. So that's about the first episode. And the second one was between 2019, 2020, just some months before the pandemic, uh, when I found uh, together with other three colleagues from several universities in Paris, a research group project entitled Untranslatables of Antiquity. Hmm. So uh, this project um, surely aimed at studying all the cases when a word or a category of words is transferred from a linguistic system to another, thus bringing a semantic shift which makes the words itself sometimes untranslatable. So most of cases were represented by categories belonging to ancient cultures, which do not find you know, the right translation in our modern languages due to semantic and anthropological lacks in our modern dictionaries or societies. So mm -hmm. um, uh, we wanted to apply this concept of lost in translation or untranslatable <laughs> cases to ancient Greek and Latin languages from the point of view of historical anthropology. And we gathered important scholars to discuss about methodological issues connected to the study of untranslatable. For example, um, we studied different approaches used by scholars in order to, to solve and all pro problems of multilingualism and translations generated by the transfer from a language to, to another. And this project aimed and currently aims at publishing a sort of lively dictionary uh, built up in a collaborative way by researchers around a specific set of words and expressions without any cogent equivalent in our modern dictionaries. And so it's slightly different, but it recalls me what you did with Africa Archive Project. And it's very important, you think, to, 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 to handle and embrace cross uh, cross-listing issues in this regard. So uh, the Untranslatable project definitely has been an important milestone that has marked my approach to multilingualism because I really practically experienced both human and scientific benefits coming from a heterogeneous and diversified approach across linguistic and cultural mm. boundaries, you know. 
Can I just ask um, for exa an example of what an untranslatable term from an ancient language might be that's not applicable in modern languages? And just to um, give an example from the other side, in with Africa Archive, we're working with three um, South African organizations to translate English research articles, um, first authored by African scholars, into six indigenous African languages. And there and and in doing so we also build a or the, the colleagues mostly um, build a glossary of terms that are untranslatable because there is no term that exists in the languages because they don't have um in in those languages they don't have um the scriptures for for anything like molecular biology wise or so like anything that's that's like in the industrialized um, context, and um, so that's from the other perspective. But what terms are not translatable into our side, for example? There's like just one for word. example, uh, yes, the the fields which are most characterized by untranslatables are politics and religious ones. For example, how a term of religion as an, an equivalent in, in ancient Greek. Uh, there is nothing in the ancient Greek vocabulary that recalls our concept of religion that has been taken from the Latin concept of religio, which uh, is not which is uh, which is not at all related to uh, the Christian concept and notion of uh, of devotion and and religion, but there are uh, many other concepts and notions that um, we have in a certain way reinterpreted uh, through our cultural bias. Mm -hmm. For example, oh, okay. beauty. There is nothing in ancient in ancient Greek which recalls our concept of beauty. Uh, beauty in ancient Greek is something related to uh, to the divine, to, to something which is higher than our human dimension, and even cosmic, which we call uh, cosmic is something that in ancient Greek is related to adornment and ritual arrangement of statues in important religious initiatives and, and render Rendezvous uh, has French uh, people say that in, in, in Athens. So uh, there are many notions that we have borrowed by ancient Greek and Latin, and uh, we have transferred how our personal experience as Occidental people uh, to interpret them, to teach them in the school. But, you know, there is much... Uh, that needs to be done to better understand and catch about the 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 seminal uh, meanings of mm -hmm. notions in ancient Greek and Latin. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, right. yes, yes, the research areas where the the semantic areas most affected by lost in translation cases and phenomenon are definitely politics and religion, and this is very important to. To, to notice, you know, because maybe from a point, a sociological and, and anthropological point of view, religion and politics are the areas which most characterize our cultures and societies. So, mm. yeah, so I think we could learn from that's, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's always, um, a, is it a trade off or? I think societies need a good balance of looking back in history and learning from best practices as well as mistakes made to to find a way forward in today's world. And I feel, yeah, also like looking at the situation in Ukraine, we don't do that enough. And why did it have to come this far again? But not to go on, well, you, you'd think we could learn also how we treat this planet. Um, because there's pr certainly been other societies where, which were not as exploitative to our own livelihood resource. Um, but, okay, so more on a positive note, what you told, told us about um, terms or concepts that are, that clearly have been misinterpreted, just because, um, 
and not intentionally so, but by applying a certain context and, and knowledge to as we study um, ancient languages. Um, I, I was just reminded of the fact that also we have in today's languages, there are certain words and phrases which do not translate into another language. And that is so funny in Swedish, um, there is a term for um, a feeling of just the right amount of something and it's called logum. It can also be negatively connotated, but often just means the perfect amount, like in a good sense, or it can mean a bare minimum of something, so just enough. And that depends very much on the context. But in so in, in Swedish, you have one word to capture that. And the context declares as a positive or negative connotated. And then it doesn't translate. We don't have a word like that in in English and German. That's the two language two other languages I'm confident with. And then I think in the German word Weltschmerz, where which expresses or translates to world pain, but the English word doesn't really explain what the German word means meaning a, a feeling of being lost by seeing the self or being aware of the suffering in the world um, and not really knowing what to do about it unless we find a way forward and, and find a mission <laughs> in our lives. But it's yeah. basically this, yeah, this, this deep pain of experiences, negative experiences made in a, during a lifetime, but also things that we cannot control, but they still affect us like feeling empathetic with the refugees or and you you think you can do something but it wouldn't solve the issue and it wouldn't you know so there's that yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's a very interesting i found that it's a very interesting topic and i will recommend the reading of a capital contribution, which is the European Dictionaries of Philosophies, which has been published by Barbara Kassan in 2004. And it brings and collects every important notions taken from philosophical uh, field. Uh, and so from a comparative point of view, it's very instructive because it puts into the same level um you know a specific notion for example the notion of space the notion of time and she takes with all the other contributors um the experience the in the experience of interpretation of several other philosophers and writers to see effectively what this notion could uh, mean uh, across languages across cultural traditions about philosophy and historical studies. So mm -hmm. it, it could be very instructive to, to gain a deeper insight about the, the topic, you know? Mm -hmm. And then how does it affect us in research when we, like, there's, there's, if you think about how terminologies arise, sometimes there is a word that's that or that's being coined in one language and then adopted by researchers in another language group. And either um, it goes back like to a, in an international consortium that there's agreement on the Latin version just to make it applicable in multiple languages or because it arises from a discipline that already grounds their terminologies on Latin taxonomies, or yeah, or another language is being adopted into other languages. Um, so how do you see, like also as a, like in your position at Frontiers, how do you see multilingualism affects science communication? Maybe that's too big a question, but that's... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think that for my experience at Frontiers, I think that multilingualism impacts massively, you know, scholarly communication nowadays. I think that uh, the multilingualism in scholarly communication and writing is still a niche topic, I would say, 
it deserves much more light than it actually has. For example, I think it's even more crucial to understand what the roles of different sectors in multilingual science are. For example, what is the role of markets? What is the role of Google? What is the role of governments, civil society, academic publishers? And last but not least, what is the role of the artificial intelligence represented by ChatGPT in this, <laughs> in all this, um, uh, in all this field? And um, albeit all these concerns, it is worth noticing. I think that there's still a lot of initiatives that we can keep running into effectively disseminate a sense of multilingual sentiment across scholarly communities and research fields. For example, one of things that really interests me as a scholarly professional is the role of technology mm. in our multilingual communication and how technology creates the potential conditions to you know, fill in the gap between the producer and the consumer of the scientific communication. Mm. Uh, my aspiration now is to do research in public policy, for example, and specifically within the public policy and technology policy fields, in order to understand what we can deduct from open knowledge movements, such as open data, open access, open education, to, you know, to make open science free of cognitive bias coming from linguistic barriers. And I think that uh, multilingualism should be added as one of the pillars of the open science movement, we, yeah. because we know how much language barrier a closed gate can be. Um, I, at this regard, I, I went through the past conversations you held around multilingualism with other MPTs, and I found very um, inspiring the initiatives that other colleagues run or are running to actively contrast linguistic inequalities, you know, in scholarly publishing. Mm. And it could be very interesting to organize a specific training session, for example, about policy research for the language justice in the research uh, ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that uh, um, <laughs> I think that much must still be done to concretely perform multilingualism without the exoticism of a, of a certain language being able to act as a barrier for the knowledge transfer, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, for example, yes, we can obviously rely on machine driving translations to support the process, to gain a first primary access to scientific contents, but then further processes are needed to provide translations of the right dignity, because, you know, there is a semantic and, as I said, anthropological substrate conveyed by the operational act of translating. So, for example, there are certain phrases that can be, be easily translated to another language, but other not, or not always. So, for example, I totally agree with those who propose to make translation a scientific category in its own, deserving its own DOI. And I also think that uh, a preprint status could fill in a gap in the publishing workflow, no? Uh, because it can allow translations to turn out into a living scientific document, open for comments, open for corrections, open for optimizations from the whole scholarly mm -hmm. community. And uh, this could be a wonderful way to get uh, refined translations with while learning local specificity mm. of how people around the world interpret specific contents, specific yeah. scientific and research contents. From a, pub from a publisher point of view, uh, um, endorsing multilingualism in scholarly publishing means to put into practice multilingualism in every single level, I think, of the publishing workflow. So uh, first of all, uh, it deals with accepting multilingualism in article contents. So a publisher should allow authors to submit articles in any language they prefer. This means that articles can be published in languages other than French or English, and the publisher should encourage authors to publish their research in their native language if they wish. Mm. 
Secondly, uh, I think that the scholarly publisher should offer translation services to authors who need their article translated into English or other languages. Then it is a question of driving a multilingual review process where articles can be reviewed in the language in which they are written. So this could be a particularly helpful, I think, for authors we are not comfortable writing in English or who prefer to receive feedback in their native language. And then it's crucial, I think, to have multilingual editorial teams mm. who are able to communicate with authors in their native language so that they can receive support in their own language. And finally, there is the publishing platform topic. I think that the scholarly publisher should have a multilingual multilingual publishing platform that uh, supports articles written in multiple languages, so to allow re readers from all over the world to access and read articles in the language of their choice. So this is something similar, I know, to what has been implemented by Herolex at a communitarian level. So this is something that with the right tools, with the right conditions, with the right policies can be easily shipped in the reality. Hmm. Yeah, I like that vision. And I think many publishers would say we don't have the budget to cater for all of that. <laughs> like it's mm -hmm. difficult to find editors who are who can cover what languages. But then does it really have to be such that um like that every like, I think it's beneficial if every publisher covers at least two languages, because I think it makes sense in today's world. If we really consider ourselves as a global society, then we must be inclusive of multilingualism or at least bilingualism for the matter. And then I think there is a growing demand again to revive regional journals and um, to let go of the focus of so-called international journals, which have a clear, what should I just call it bias, but a clear focus on Western researchers as well. And the language barrier helps, well, helps as in, is, is much reason for that because yeah, it just makes it difficult if, if researchers of other language groups are forced to first language, learn English to a sufficient level. And, and there has been measure whether um, I've been reviewing an article that for the first time measured the cost of translation by researchers. And it's like all of us um, non-native English speakers can easily relate how much extra effort it means to, yeah, to, to practice research and then to publish research in a foreign language. And then also losing the ability over time of communicating your research in your mother tongue. So that's the other trade-off um, down the line. And mm -hmm. you might ask, so what if research and science communication is to serve society, what, like, why would it then only serve um, such a small um, percentage of society who is capable of speaking and reading English? Um, anyway, so where I'm going with this, would it be... Feasible. I think, I think a model that I just um, envision as you as you um, voiced your calls for action for publishers, um, if we allow or if we encourage researchers to consider also their regional um, university presses, regional journals um, that support their mother tongues and national languages and regional languages, and then these would also be bilingual meaning they will provide also summaries of the research outcome in English, French, Arabic, or other of the, any of the major languages, which are also covered by the United Nations because they, uh, Spanish, because they cover major language groups. And then this would, I think, allow for the level of, or a good balance between research that is regionally and locally relevant and research that, um, and also provide access to research that has a global impact or potentially like mm -hmm. looking at global patterns. And then, sorry. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so how would this play out? So 
Well, how do you handle this at the frontiers? Is is there already an infrastructure at frontiers, or is this on the roadmap? To sorry, I should have looked this up before. English, only English. But um, so what they did, what what I said earlier is something's coming from my personal experience as a multilingual yeah. author. Because uh, I have encountered some challenges as a multilingual author in the past, but much more in French than in English, I have to say. Mm -hmm. And this may be for several reasons, I think, of course, for the purism that distinguishes the French language from all the others. We know about the purist conduct of French people in academia. And then for the existence of several variants of English, you know, the American English, UK English, and so on, which, uh, like, you're not often make the process of writing, evaluating, and correcting journal articles and chapters more flexible. So, as a multilingual author, I've seen the challenges, I've seen the barriers that can arise when trying to publish research in languages other than English or French, or in French, as I said. Mm. But this has made me more critical of the dominance of English and French language publications in the academic world. It reflects a certain way the colonialist perspective in historical studies. And that mm. has motivated me to advocate for greater recognition of non-English language research, because I believe that only by promoting multilingualism in scholarly publishing, we can help create a more equitable and more inclusive academic landscape. And um, in more practical terms, I've had sometimes to spend, yes, additional time, additional effort on language editing to ensure that my work met the high standards of English and French language journals. Uh, however, I've also found that some journals are more supportive of multilingual authors than others. And I've been able to find success by seeking out these publications. So there is a heterogeneous landscape that went about multilingualism in scholarly publishing and that needs to take into account even the, you know, the best practices of the single journal mm. about, about linguistic diversity. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, this is a, a very a very rich and complicated topic. I <laughs> I think, but yes. But like I said earlier, I think once we appreciate multilingualism and once we once we acknowledge that it should be, like you said, suggested also like one of the pillars of open science. And like in my definition, I always mention it as such. Um, and once, like, like an increasing number of scholarly stakeholders mm -hmm. adopt multilingualism, and I think that's coming. It's becoming more and more of a discussion item. How can we facilitate this? How can we build it into the technical level? There's there's also like small baby steps that the researchers and the publishers can take in facilitating multilingualism and science communication or scholarly communication by publishers having a query for or allowing researchers to submit a summary or uh, in another language it's not necessarily mm -hmm. translating even if the editorial team is primarily english but the thing is like, apparently i don't know to what extent but some researchers tend to write the research article first in their native language and then transcribe it into English just because it's the only feasible way forward for them and or anyways at some point they pro they write a summary in their native language and that can then also be or should be able to co-submit it to the article um and also, like you pointed out, um, like get it onto your eye. I like that also very much. First of all, for the whole article as well, or the manuscript, which is basically the metadata to the <laughs> to the data set of um, well, at least in, in the life sciences, which is the actual result of a study. Um, because it's, a project never ends unless the funding ends, and there will always be. Um, 
comments and suggestions and new ways to interpret the data. So also the English version should be a living document to continue to be explored further. Yeah. Um, but as well, very much so the translation, because every translation is a way to interpret. Just to the fact, um, due to the fact that we postulated earlier in this conversation, because every language comes with a highly specific cultural context and way to interpret information and to contextualize information into the geographical and cultural context of that language group. Sure. So it can, sure. and that's also one of the major pain points, I think, why we should allow, again, more multilingualism, because a lot of context, context, regional context information gets lost in translation. Because, like we said, there are no concepts in English, what you would describe in Italian, or maybe also the way you describe the results of your research and into freedom is not easy to put in words in English not for a native English speaker, but also because the concepts don't exist in that language. <laughs> and for that matter, yes. I think everybody can only win if we provide um, at least two language and um, yeah, versions. And this again, like can can also be shorter versions for yeah, for resource limitations yeah. reasons. Um, but yeah, I think only then science really makes sense. Plus, for well, any English, um, English first language um, research study in a specific lingual context, by like that's not not English should by default also have to be translated into that language because otherwise there's no reason and it's not fair to do research on a particular word region if you don't make the results accessible to people who live in that region or in that cultural context. Yeah. yeah, I think that it depends even on the discipline you raise, because for example, uh, I can I can speak of my personal experience. I studied niche topics and at a certain point, I'm, I had almost the impression of being the only one in this planet studying it. So uh, in my field, a lot of information uh, coming from 20 and 21st century archaeological fields mm -hmm. uh, are in national languages, for example, in Macedon. So scientific publication, obviously, for my research area are predominantly in English and French. But if you really want to go through the details, which you need to make accurate assessments of what ancient findings tell us about ancient cultures, so then you typically need local language skills for translating, you know. And uh, so as a multilingual researcher and now a professional in open access publisher, uh, I found uh, that reading research publishing in languages other than English or French has been extremely valuable and I'm really committed to ensure that researchers from diverse linguistic backgrounds have a voice in the global academic conversation because translating science, as I said, is a form of open science. Yeah, so I I want to dive back to a comment you made um, in the beginning. And I think you also meant it with a, or, or expressed it that you don't really stand behind that um, sometimes Latin and ancient Greek are referred to as dead languages. But thanks to your explanation mm -hmm. and also how we um, explored how much we're still influenced today by both languages, also how we use them in, in for numbers and or also Arabic um, and our writing and how it influences our cultural understanding or misunderstanding of where we are from and how we've been influenced over the centuries. But would, do you... Like the concept of, or the understand, or what's the, the what's the word? Like, would you agree that Latin is a dead language, or do you see it pretty much alive because we constantly use it, just not as necessary? They, yeah, they, yeah, they are alive, too much alive, I think. Uh, it depends even on the educational programs run by specific governments, you know, for example, you're in Italy, Latin and ancient Greek are taught during the 
the most crucial years of a person's life um, during the adolescence. So uh, the conception, the understanding of the world for the adolescents come from the learning of ancient languages. And I think that everything's coming from ancient cultures is still alive in our way of interpreting and seeing the phenomenon which around which surround us so they are very very alive and i think that it's it's very useful you know to 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 renew uh the conversation the scholarly conversation about ancient languages to refresh even educational programs from single uh, by by single government actions in in in, in the european countries Mm. And that brings me also to um, what I'm also personally passionate about is fostering indigenous knowledge. And the UNESCO Open Science Recommendations also explicitly says that we as scholars yeah. need to look and acknowledge other knowledge systems, um, including traditional and indigenous knowledge. And like working on African context, we deal with mm. thousands of languages that are native to the region. Um, and some would argue, yeah, there is no, well, some languages are actually at the brink of extinction. So there's not so many people left who actually speak the languages. Same is true in Latin America mm. and Asia, I think all around the world, really. Um, and also in Germany, it's um, like, it's unfortunate that we lose dialects increasingly so <laughs> because also dialects sometimes carry um century old contextual phrases which might inform also our understanding like you said of today's world um but yeah back to indigenous knowledge uh, knowledge and indigenous uh languages yeah again also here i think there's there's concepts to be lost if we um if we don't, uh, yeah, like, or let's say more positively phrased, um, we have a chance to preserve also knowledge with the languages and by fostering multilingualism on the regional, national, local levels to, yeah, to, to also um, preserve the ecological and cultural understanding of these regions. And I think that also yeah. plays an important role for cultural identity for for the people of societies. And science can do its part to to acknowledge that and to help preserve, um, yeah, help preserve and help to build bridges. So, yeah, it sounds a bit yeah. philosophical, and um, but. I think that's basically, <laughs> I think this is also what research per se should embrace more of again and less, well, as much as we need the technical approach and standardized approaches, but to um, be more appreciative again of the values and and also the wider context of why we do research in the first place and what it yeah. benefits us as a global society, but also on the local level. Yeah, I think that that's something uh, which needs to start from the high school uh, teaching, you know, because I think that uh, we have a mission to make our young generations more aware about the importance of language as intangible, uh, intangible um, patrimoine, as uh, French people say it. Um, uh, it's almost an unscientific approach to the question sometimes. It's more personal, you know, and even now I think it's interesting because if you think about it, you and I were speaking from different first language positions. We are conversing in English about multilingualism. This is a sort of major reflection about language, and I think that it could be very useful, fruitful, important for young people, young minds to do the same thing, you know? Uh, so yeah, um, so there's there's much work to be done, but also I think we touched on a few things. Oh, also for researchers, if we if if scholars build a practice of just translating some of their 
yeah, providing a short summary or at least providing a translation of the title in a native language or another language, um, if English is a native language, then we would already come quite far. And then the abstract could be, so the, the key metadata, if those would be translated, there would already be an increase of access, like, and it would make a huge difference for a globally connected and inclusive scientific community. And and like you said, I think this can also be further um, facilitated by um, translation tools, digital tools like Google Translate, DeepL.com. Um, there's other university built tools. Basically, and we agree that there's there's a a bright future for multilingualism in, in academia, right? Would you agree with yeah. that? Yeah. Do you yeah. Feel that uh, there's still a lot yeah, of yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Of course, and we. Uh, I think we should also wondering about the importance and the role of funders of institutions in supporting mm -hmm. multilingual authors and university presses, for example. Um, uh, I think that um, we should first go back to our basic fundamental question. For example, as a researcher, who I'm trying to influence who I'm trying to speak to, who I'm trying to help with my research. And if the answer is a local population, for example, that does not speak English as a native language, then it should be part of our mission as researchers, as um, academic publishing professionals to practice multilingualism in a more performative and, uh, and sustainable way. Mm -hmm. But obviously, Researchers need obviously to be supported by institutional stakeholders. So I think that the real message to funders as well as universities to think about what potential benefits could come from translating the research and getting it into another language. Um, for example, institutions and funders can better support multilingual authors and promote greater recognition of non-English language research by providing resources and infrastructures, e-infrastructures to support the publication and dissemination of research in multiple languages. Uh, this can include obviously funding for language editing and translation services, as well as support for open access publishing platforms that are more inclusive. Um, so institutions and funders play a role in promoting diversity and inclusion by recognizing the value and the contribution of multilingual researchers. Um, we can, for example, follow more systematically the Helsinki's initiatives on multilingualism in scientific communication, which has been conceived and prepared in 2019, if I'm not wrong, by federation by the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies from the Committee of uh, for Public Information from the University of Norway and uh, the Cast Action European Network for Research Evaluation in the Social Sciences and Humanities. So there is effectively important initiatives which has be which is. Um, which has been run by to, 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 to promote multilingualism across disciplines, across universities, across nations, you know? Mm. So, yeah. yeah, there is maybe a bright future, but we need the help of universities, publishers, and funders. Yeah, I agree. And the good news is also that the literature discovery tools, my favorite ones are the ones that are publisher independent, like the Lens um lens.org and um, base search uh open knowledge maps which is based on base which other mm -hmm. school scholar if you wish um it's just not very well organized um but so these tools are actually for google scholar i'm not sure but base and and the lens they're certainly capable of also um disclosing research articles that are written in non in, in languages other than English. So mm -hmm. then you can at least see that in your research discipline, um, articles have been published in other languages and then 
as a way to yeah to use also translational tools to to see what exactly has been written about and to get in touch with the authors and maybe um also consult an interpreter to help with the communication but usually for 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 the yeah on that level the science communicate like i think the yeah there's ways to to learn from each other beyond the language barriers and what i'm where i'm highlighting this also there's certainly journals that researchers can publish in in their native language so not everything has to be translated into english but um, i think the way forward and to make best possible use of scholarly knowledge is to think multilingual or at least bilingual to to get started and there's yeah, like I said, yeah. I think there's already good examples. Thanks for mentioning this. I will also look look into policies that have been adopted based on the or referring to the Helsinki Initiative that um, promote multilingualism from a top down approach, which makes it easier for researchers to to embrace it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Eleonora. It's been quite a thank quite you. A thank you too. Thank you too. And I think we could probably talk for hours about this topic, <laughs> but I think we covered almost everything I want to talk about in this podcast. Yeah. I really thank you, Joe, for giving me this opportunity. And I will just say if anyone is listening and wants to contribute and organize, you know, webinars or workshops around policy research and language justice in open science, then I'd be really open to discuss. I'm really happy. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Also, I would volunteer for that. <laughs> but <anyone laughs> else, you can also contact Eleanor directly, and um, and you'll certainly hear more more about the topic in the space. And and you're most um, warmly welcome back to continue the conversation once we have identified new <laughs> aspects you. to cover. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Really glad, yeah. <laughs>